It's uh, great to be with you. Um, we're kicking off a new school year, um, uh, thinking about uh, all you professionals and your, 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 uh, your work as you get started, and most importantly, thinking about the children around you. And um, so this session is really about all those children. It's about universal efforts and screening and intervening. Um, I do want to uh, take my hat off to Sherry and Chris, my colleagues from Pearson. This is uh, going to be uh, a unique session. I feel like a, a pilot flying in the clouds um, because of some technology challenges. So Chris is setting in Texas. I'm setting in Arizona. And uh, we're going to control this duly and uh, hopefully have a great deal of uh, new information to share with us. There's some exciting things going on. So let's go to the next slide, Chris. Thanks. Um, so, um, yeah, that's me. That's, uh, I'm Steve Elliott. Um, uh, what I'm, what's most important and interesting is that the materials we're going to share with you, the SSIS, uh, SEL versions of the class-wide intervention program, and some forthcoming new assessments, which are, um, I think, uh, time-wise really uh, uh, valuable for, for purposes of screening. These have all been acknowledged and recognized by CASEL, some of you are quite familiar with CASEL, and uh, as evidence-based programs meeting their what they call select program criteria. So let's get into the objectives, Chris. And uh, so the goal here is, uh, is literally to be helpful. Health professionals like teachers, psychologists, social workers, counselors that are joining us today from around the country to, to really think and to be able to efficiently and effectively identify all students' social emotional needs and provide them direct support that improves key skills. Now that sounds like an, a, a very challenging task. Um, in some ways it is. But I think we have worked hard with the development of these materials to simplify it. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of proud that we often talk about intervention simplified. And uh, that's the goal. So we're going to review FCL definitions and, and uh, some key concepts that really help you organize to, be, to, to act. We want to examine approaches to screening. There's actually quite a few of them. And this hasn't been talked about or written a lot about. But we want to look at screening and the related assessment tools needed to enact a good screening system. Uh, we want to review evidence-based instructional skills, and I'm going to do that through highlighting a particular unit that's uh, part of the class-wide intervention program. And then we want to think about some alternative models for enacting what most people, I think, would refer to as a multi-gated assessment for making decisions about student support needs. So, um, let's move onward, Chris. So as part of joining us for this session, uh, Sherry sent you a couple documents. Um, if you didn't notice them, please look closely because you were sent the PowerPoints to, to download and to use with your colleagues and two documents that are representative of a series of what I call intervention simplified briefs. The two that you got, one is on screening and monitoring the development of SEL skills, and the second is an example of teaching uh, a uh, SEL skill, particularly a relationship skill, which is, in fact, what I'm going to show you today. So these documents support and uh, reinforce uh, the, the, the content today. Next. So there, there are a number of tools that we're going to use, and Chris is laying all these out on the screen for you as I talk. The first one is a, a rating form. The second one is a, uh, a brief version of that larger teacher rating form. And we're referring to it as the SSIS Brief Social and Mental Health Scale. I'll say more about these as we go. Then there's the brief version of the student form. Very important. Lots of people in screening today, as much as possible, want to get students' voice into the, to the process. And a lot of the measures out there just are not user-friendly for students. I think where this one is. And finally, there's a, a, a standby that we've used for the last several years, uh, a criterion reference form that's particularly useful for a teacher to set down, only for a teacher to use, to set down and think about his or her entire class, kind of in one take of where they're at, what they're doing well, 
and how, how they're functioning. And these all link any results you get from any one of these four assessments that I've outlined link to an intervention program called the Class-Wide Intervention Program. And as I go through it, you'll hear me refer to it as CIP, C-I-P, okay? And um, these are all, all the materials to, to do the intervention, I think quite unique, are online. And they're at a website. Um, currently, they're on a Pearson website. But starting in November, they're going to be on a new website. Partnering with Pearson is a group called the SSIScolab.com. Keep in mind, it's not until November that that site launches. But uh, all these materials are available now. And if you purchase them and use them from Pearson, they'll, they'll all be recognized and just transferred to the site. It's a, it's a new and improved site, basically. We'll move forward and talk about definitions and, and the valued behaviors, those behaviors that you're focusing on trying to teach. I particularly like this definition, slide seven, about um, social-emotional learning that Maurice Elias and one of his doctor, doc students, uh, Dominique Mosseri, developed. And I'm going to read it because it highlights, I think, some important aspects. Social-emotional learning is defined as the process of acquiring knowledge, skills, attitudes, and beliefs to identify and manage emotions. So there's a lot of aspects, managing emotions. An aspect. Then to care about others, classic, classic social emotional learning, to make good decisions, to behave ethically and responsibly, and to develop positive relationships and to avoid negative behaviors. So if you step back just for a minute, there's four main clauses there, and it says, hey, if you do a good job of evaluating and teaching social emotional learning skills, you're, you're covering quite a territory in the life space of the child. Okay? Um, so next is, I want to situate this. There's been a lot of talk. Some of this has been generated out of some of the terrible things that have happened in schools, uh, school shootings, et cetera. But some of this has been just generated out of overall thinking about the well-being of students. And a lot of people are starting to frame social emotional learning as part of, as part of mental health. So mental health includes, from my perspective, and I'm quoting here from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, it includes emotional, psychological, and social well-being. That's indeed what we're about, social, emotional, psychological well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act. It, it also helps determine how we handle stress and relate to others and make choices. This is true of us as adult professionals on this call and of young children. So mental health is really important at every stage of life, from childhood to adolescence. And the longer I'm at this, the more I think this is an incredibly important aspect. Um, however, with the next slide, um, we borrow from Matt Groening. Uh, yes, it's a little humorous. And if you take a close look at that, my goodness, I hope that's not one of your classrooms, but, but it it, in a sense, with a little humor, um, it, it illustrates there's a range of things uh, that kids can display. And unfortunately, in this cartoon, everything is negative, okay? Now, we're, we're actually very interested in the positive, in strength-based, positive behaviors, okay? So what we're going to talk about today, very few, uh, if you there are very few of these behaviors that we're going to talk about are negative, but there are times when we're taking the pulse of all kids that we do need to focus on some things. So if I was looking into this classroom, I would look at that child who supposedly is doing some hallucinating. Then I might look at that child as sticking his or her foot out to trip another student. So what's my point? My point is, although we spend the majority of the time, I do, I care about desired behaviors that we can increase and teach. We do want to monitor uh, because some of the students will come to us with some of these co-occurring negative behaviors. So uh, slide 10, Chris. This is really a note about mental health and SEL. Current models of mental health conceptualize complete mental health as being really composed of two distinct dimensions. One dimension involves psychosocial distress or negative experiences. We've got to care about that. The second dimension uh, is about psychosocial well-being and positive experiences. That's what this program is focused on. And, and, and in fact, we know we can intervene on positive
positive and affect negative. Um, sometimes when we intervene on negative, we don't necessarily affect positive. So um, it's important, it's really important that research shows that these two dimensions do not, do not form a single continuum with wellness or illness at one end and wellness at the other end. So my point, the critical point here, although you may be primarily interested in a universal program for enhancing students' SEL competencies, as I am, you may want to consider at least screening when you take the time, when you've taken the time to screen and monitor for indicators of some psychological distress as part of a multi-tiered assessment intervention system. Thus, a need for a different type of screening assessment needs to be considered, okay? Needs to be considered. Slide 11. So slide 11, many of you will recognize, and we can show them all, uh, all five areas um, that we're interested in on the, on the pro-social, on the SEL side. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, responsible decision-making. These are actually all behaviors that are part of the castle model. I mean, as you see, the little wheel, the castle wheel that talks about these five areas. And um, all of my assessments, all of the SSIS assessments in the SEL edition yield information about these five areas, whether you're using a long assessment with 51 items that a teacher completes, 46 items that a student completes, or you use the briefer new ones that are coming out, or that beautiful little uh, class-wide teacher conceptualization of SEL, they all measure self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. So slide 12, why are these behaviors? Um, uh, why, why these behaviors, I should say? Because, because we know they matter. Okay, we actually do. And I'm not saying that just sort of off the top and that people like these behaviors. They, there's really research. The key studies that I want to show you that shows these skills do matter. So, and if they matter, of course, we want to teach them. But let's take a minute. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Time's precious. But slide 13 um, highlights that I want to show you a couple things that have a strong database too. So slide 14. Just take a minute and look at slide 14 with me, okay? It says, SEL skills are key academic enablers. So I want to just situate that a little bit. Back in early 2000s, I was doing work with Jim DiPerna, Rob Volpe, and we were looking at the role, at the time we called them interpersonal skills. Some people still do, by the way. Uh, but there were many of these uh, relationship behaviors, self-management behaviors, uh, responsible decision-making behaviors. We call those interpersonal skills at that point in time. And what we did, we started looking at the relationship of those skills to children's classroom achievement. This is an excerpt out of a published article in 202 where we actually studied what is the relationship between interpersonal skills and reading achievement. Well, the picture is what's called a structural equation modeling. I want to highlight the interpersonal skills uh, in this, and, and it shows that they don't directly affect reading, but they do directly affect motivation. And in turn, motivation affects students' engagement, which in turn has reading achievement dividends. So what's the big takeaway message about this model? First off, many of the skills in the class-wide intervention program are, in fact, known to be academic enabling behaviors. They're good for social reasons, but they're also good for academic reasons. So the, the major takeaway is we're not, you know, doing this. We don't think this is not getting kids smarter just because they're able to take advantage of these things, okay? But, but they are enabling kids to clearly engage in learning. Not smarter, just better able to take advantage of learning opportunities. So classrooms will operate better together. Kids will learn from other kids. And even if they don't actually have a lot more academic uh, stimulation, what they're getting from their teacher will be consumed better. That's what it says. So uh, slide 15 illustrates a, a, a 
published study on the screener, one of the screening components that I'm going to highlight today. And although there's several pieces of information that will appear on the screen, sort of if excerpts from this published study, the, the, the bottom line, the last point on the page, is says collectively, collectively, the technical evidence um, for the SSIS screener meets or exceeds accepted criteria for well-functioning screening measures. You're going to see the screener in more detail, but anytime anyone develops a screener, they have to think about how does it operate? What are the consequences when I screen children's behavior? And the desired consequence is what we call a true positive. In other words, if a child does have a problem, we identify. If a child doesn't have a problem, we also identify that after true positives. But sometimes you get some screeners, and every screener is this way. I'm not suggesting mine uh, that I've developed are, are perfect. But they identify what you call true negatives, okay? That means you don't have the problem. So those are good. True negatives, true positives are good. What you want to avoid are false positives or false negatives. So that means false means you're getting misled. Positive means they have the desired behavior. Negative means they have the negative behaviors, the problem behaviors. The point is you don't have to worry about that if you select a well-established screening tool. And the SSIS has several of them now, shows that they meet strong criteria to identify kids accurately. So slide 16. As we look at slide 16, there are three studies that the abstracts, I should say, for three studies, all done by a colleague at Penn State, James Clyde Deferna, and a research team there. It's important to know that these were all studies done, funded by the U.S. Department of Ed, with independent uh, objective evaluators in addition to the people who implemented the program. What program did they implement? The class-wide intervention program. That's what I'm going to showcase today. What did they learn? They learned that this is an evidence-based program. And if you click to slide 17, this kind of summarizes what they learned. They learned that when you do this intervention, it, you, can, you, you achieve what we call a triple positive impact. That's why we talk about the, the SIP as having, uh, fitting the triple positive impact theory. And, and what is that? It means first what you see is that children's social emotional skills increase. They, when they increase, you can currently see many, not necessarily all, but many problem behaviors decrease. And when you get those two things happening, increase of SEL, decrease of problem behaviors, what happens in the classroom? Well, you see many kids' academic engagement goes up goes back to that model I showed you, motivation affects engagement. And when kids are engaged, they're, they're acquiring new knowledge in many cases, and it manifests itself in improved achievement. Uh, in particular, in the research, achievement on standardized tests, statewide tests, et cetera. As a result of this work, as illustrated in slide 18, um, the, the class-wide intervention program is one, I, I believe it's 12 now, there might be, it might be 13, on the, on the SEL, um, uh, Castle's SEL program site. And we qualify because we have this evidence base as a rigorous evidence-based program. So the highest level of confidence in effectiveness is called SEL or their select program. So, so there's research on the tools that I'm going to talk about. Now let's move to thinking about implementation, okay? Slide 19. When you think about implementation, there are a, a, a number of challenges. You, know, you can have a great program, but if it's not implemented well or thoughtfully, it doesn't have its uh, effect. And so um, a couple points about the overarching program that's offered under the SSIS SEL edition. There are aligned assessments with interventions. So that, that I'm going to talk more about that, but there's this strong alignment between what you measure and what you teach. Secondly, it is well suited for multi-tiered support systems. I suspect 
many of you are in states and school districts that embrace a multi-tiered system of various support, starting with universal and moving towards selected and targeted intervention, and maybe ultimately, in some kids' cases, maybe to, towards special education as another form of support. I want to I want you to think about your systems and in, start thinking about how do you do assessment in those systems so that it helps you make good decisions. So we'll start with that with the next slide, slide 20. This is my way in this slide. You can see four circles, capital FDL competencies. That was the touchstone for the design of our assessments. In fact, the redesign of some of the SSIS assessments. So that meaning that the content valued in the capital model, those five areas, were reflected in the assessment scales and specifically in the items and the discrete behaviors that we're measuring in children. In those assessments, the results lead you to interventions. Those interventions are actually skill-based units that, that are directly in line with the CASEL model and the assessment. And when you do this, when you maximize reducing error in your measure, maximize focus on, on, on skills that are highly valued, what do you get? You get this dividend on the right-hand side, improvements in student social and academic function. So the takeaway is what you measure is what you teach in this system, and what you measure and teach is 100% aligned with a capital competency framework. So we move now to slide 21. And I look at this, it always makes me think of a Christmas tree, which is a positive thought. Um, this is a, our version here of a multi-tiered support system. And, and we're going to, today, we're going to focus, as, as highlighted uh, with a red box here, as you click on it, on Tier 1. The other tiers are important, but what you do in Tier 1 has a great bearing on how well you operate in Tier 2 and Tier 3. So it's foundational, okay? So I have a couple observations that I want to share with you. Those observations are the following. Tier 1 involves all students and many educators. No secret. Tier 1, it really captures your, is central to the values and culture of your school. It's in all classrooms, supposedly, or in all gen ed classrooms, supposedly. Now, a couple points, a couple fine points. Every teacher, I know every teacher in Tier 1, if they're working in the United States, has about 65,000 minutes of instructional time. Count it, 65,000 minutes. I know you don't think you have enough time, <laughs> but, but if you work 185 days a year, six and a half hours a day, or six and a quarter, you've got approximately 65,000 minutes to use. That matters, time matters to me, time matters to you. Every teacher in tier one, by the way, already teaches SEL skills every day. How about that? But, but what happens is many of them, it's not explicit. It's, in effect, what we call a hidden curriculum. We teach, we teach through our modeling, through our value system as adults in front of groups of kids. What I'm trying to do is capture the, the energy that's already being used to discipline kids, to model for kids in desired ways, et cetera, and to structure it in a very explicit way and in a coordinated way across classrooms, okay? Now, you're going to go, well, oh, this is going to take a lot of time. No, it is not. At Tier 1, to do the fundamental intervention that was highlighted in that research that DePerna and others have done, it's going to take a teacher 2% of the school year. Do the math, 2% of 65,000 minutes. It's going to take from students 1.5% of that 65,000 minutes, okay, of their class time. A very small amount of time to, to dedicate to teaching skills in Tier 1. So what happens in Tier 1 influences practice in Tier 2. Now, a couple possibilities as we go forward. This is what I'm going to play on, these possibilities. I'm going to give you two, think about two opportunities for assessment that happen in Tier 1. Entry into Tier 1, okay, and exit from Tier 1. I want you to think about teachers assessing all students in 40 minutes or less in their classroom. 40 minutes or less, 
That's, you know, you do the math. You probably got 25 students, about a minute and a half a student. I want to encourage participation from all students when they're able. Usually third grade students and above can do good self-assessment, maybe second grade. There's reading issues involved here, of course, as well as cognitive abilities to reflect on him or herself in an in a, in a objective way, somewhat objective way. I'm going to highlight that if you do assessment, you spend this energy, it must link to instruction. It has to have an, an instructional dividend. And the closer there's this alignment between what you assess to what you teach, that's time saving, that's smart, and that allows the second assessment to yield information about potential change if you do that. And that's ethical. If you're going to try to teach and change behavior, you have to know what were the effects of that. So it leads to this notion of what I'm calling core SEL skills. That'll get defined, but think of core as fundamental skills. And we're going to talk about 10 of them that are core. And they're going to be taught in a safer, what does that mean? Safer, an evidence-based program that has triple positive impact. I'm going to tease you. I'm going to elaborate on safer as we go, okay? So next slide. MTS, multi-tiered support systems and assessment gates. Um, you'll read a little bit if, you, if, you're, if you're a school site geek or something and you're trying to understand uh, some technical aspects to screening, et cetera. You'll, you'll get into what's called assessment gates. And here are my gates. There's three of them. <laughs> kind of looks like a garden gate, doesn't it? Assessment gates. Assessments embedded in the system function as gates, or if you will, procedural points for making decisions about students' needs. So we've got a big gate that's ready. We're ready for everyone to come through that gate. We've got a little smaller gate. That's probably only going to, in most multi-tiered systems, going to be maybe 10 to 15 percent of kids have to go through that gate. And then we've got a smaller gate, which would take you to potentially tier three, and that might be 5 to 10 percent of kids. So this multi-gating design generally starts, and I've already noted this, with all kids and progresses to getting a narrower and narrower focus. <clears throat> and the reason we do that is because the kids that we have to focus on need more support from us. <clears throat> Ideally, assessments are needed to accurately do two things, okay? They're needed to identify students' strengths and areas of weaknesses in need of improvement. That's the big goal that most all SEL programs have, focusing on the positive, saying which of these five SEL domains, self-awareness, self-management, relationship skills, social awareness, responsible decision-making, do our strengths and that most kids are doing well, and which ones are relative weaknesses we need to improve. And that's kind of looking at the whole group. But these screenings, while we're doing them, why not also try to identify students experiencing significant psychosocial stress? These are kids that have some potentially are at risk for some mental health difficulties and, and, and who's going to need additional services. Maybe the universal is just not going to be enough. It's part of what they need, but they may need more. Or they need to be monitored a little closer because there's some signs of concern. Okay, now the next slide, I'm going to go a little further on talking about these gates. And as you can see now, I've interspersed them um, between the various tiers. And as we think about these, and it, most SEL assessments focus on positive psychosocial behavior, that big gate one at the bottom, leaving the detection of students with significant psychosocial stress to be identified through other methods. What is that other method? The most frequent is a teacher referral or a nomination by a teacher saying, raises his or her hand saying, there's some difficulties here, I think. But what do we know? As good as teachers are, and believe me, I re I've written articles on teachers as tests and think highly of them because they have tons of knowledge about kids. If they spend three or four weeks with kids, they're learning a lot and they know a lot. But, but we know that some teachers and some experts have trouble identifying internalizing difficulties of students. Therefore, it's questionable whether you should rely entirely on referrals. They have a potential bias, in other words, a, a, that you miss 
internalize withdrawal, anxiety, um, uh, depression, some of those aspects that lead to anger and, and, and resentment of the system, um, sometimes withdrawal from the system, sometimes negative things about the system. So we need to take a, a little stronger step than just teacher eyeballs on kids. We need some additional support. It's still, that teacher is going to help tell us, but kids are going to help tell us. Students are going to be able to tell us. So it's important, in, it, it, that's an important decision designing a multi-tiered SEL system is whether or not one or more of the assessment gates is sensitive to indicators of mental health. You can decide. I'm not telling you it has to do it down here at the big gate at the bottom of the page, but it should probably by the time you get through tier one actually have it at least at the middle gate. Otherwise, just think of it. Maybe a month or two or three months have gone by as you're doing tier one, and although you might be seeing this child, you're missing something. So. Last point on this page, an unsettled matter is how many gates are needed to come up with a highly qualified system. I will tell you the literature is not clear about it. We don't have a good scientific base whether two gates are better than three gates or, 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 or you can get by with a big first gate if you, if you do it well. There's some difference of opinion. But clearly decisions are made every time a student moves into or out of a tier. So these decisions are best informed by using some tool with valid data rather than just judgments of teachers. Even though that's important, I'm not discounting that, but you, you want to lean as much as possible on some of the science that we have about identifying problems, mental health problems, at the same time that we're primarily focusing on SEL. So let's, let's jump into some of the tools. So that's uh, slide 24. Effective tools are available, but you still need a strategic plan. I mean, it's one thing to have a great tool, but you've got to use it well. If you're just like a carpenter, you get lots of tools, but you've got to know how to use them. So if you want to be effective, uh, efficiently um, help teachers support students, that's the goal if you want to do that. So, so let me just uh, ha ask Chris to display all of page 25 as we go through, and as he's doing that, let me just say a couple things. SEL assessments provide data to answer questions. Ultimately, assessments are about answering questions with data that help us make good decisions about students' needs. And, and I think many assessments out there, and I say this with some confidence, I've been spending the last year working with a group uh, at the Burroughs Institute of Testing at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, sponsored by the Spencer Foundation, to help people learn how to think better about assessment data, okay? It's one thing to have a great assessment, you get a result, you get a score, but ask yourself at the beginning, what question am I trying to answer? So most times, screening questions are, <clears throat> you're trying to answer a question, what are students' SEL strengths and areas in need of improvement? That's a classic screening question. Many of you are keen on intervention, so you have an instructional needs question. What skills can be taught, and how can this be done effectively? And, of course, if you start teaching and spending time with kids trying to change their behavior, you've got to monitor progress. You want to know if they grow, that there's growth. There's, so those questions are there. <clears throat> then there's this looming question out there, the identification question. I know in a lot of schools, SEL is thought about as a group thing. And we're not trying to screen individuals with problems. I know that. And I think that that's the first order of business. But while we're doing screening, while we're doing instruction, we have great opportunities to identify, are there some kids who have some persistent difficulties that need more intensive support? Let's not ignore that. Let's not ignore that. That there might be two or three in a classroom. Hopefully not. And then ultimately, if you spend energy, spend money on an intervention, you have to know if it worked. So you have program effectiveness questions. The interesting point is no single assessment is designed to validly answer all these questions. I know of no assessment that can answer all these questions. Okay? I know some people might try to. But it takes an integrated system of assessments to yield valid scores and provide reports that really link to intervention actions. That's why you're going to see we have this family of assessments, 
that we call the SSIS family of assessments. It's an integrated system. So 26, I'm sorry about this. This is a dense slide. I'm, I apologize, folks. But there's a number of things I want to nurture in your thinking as you go forward when you're trying to select uh, an FDL Tier 1 assessment. Don't just take any assessment. There's some good ones out there. I know some good ones. Um, and, uh, and, but there is only one. There's only one that is directly aligned with capsule and with an intervention program. Some of you know of DEFTA, it's a, it's, a, it's a fine tool. It's aligned and influenced by capsule, but there's not an intervention program. And, and you can say, well, what, what matter does that have? Well, if you're trying to make good intervention decisions, what to teach, and you're trying to make good intervention evaluations, how well did it go, you want very little error. You want to measure what you teach, okay? And then you're going to get a clear signal about how well it's going and where you need to go next. So i got a list of nine things. I'm going to read them. Boom. Focus on screening assessments that you would make the decision. Do I want to be positive only, just SEL skills, or am I willing to also monitor a few what I'm calling negative behaviors, mental health indicators? Number two, students' ability to complete a self-assessment is really important to think about. This this is a, a, a big add-on in my thinking how valuable student self-assessment is. And you can generally start at grade 3 and go all the way up to grade 12. All of our assessments have that feature. Teachers as assessments, don't just ask them to be referral agents raising their hand. Give them a structure for taking their excellent observations to make good decisions. Four, the timing of assessment. When is the best time to do a screening assessment? Well, it's coming up, October. Why do I say that? Because you've all had, by this time, most students have been in classroom 20, 25 days. Most teachers have a good uh, baseline of information. The kids have learned to interact with each other. So you're getting some good sample representative behavior. So your assessments are likely to be much more sensitive. And then, of course, if you do a screening at the beginning of the year, it's useful, not required, to do something April, May, depending on when your school ends, to try to understand what, what's happened over the course of the year, particularly if you've done an intervention. Time to complete assessments. This is a big deal. I know it's a big deal to everybody. It depends on the assessment, but we have created assessments, that, as you think about it from a student, uh, individual student, no more than seven minutes but you can probably get it down to four or five minutes. And as you become accustomed to using these assessments, you become more efficient. You want to think about the reliability and validity of assessments for your population students. What do I mean by that? Well, think about it. Who are your students? You want, a, you want an assessment tool that represents them. If you've got a significant proportion of Hispanic students, you want an assessment tool that has had in the norming sample a significant proportion of those students. I use that as an example only, but so look at the, the, the basis of the data. Consequences of assessments. Um, the goal, the goal of all of these SEL systems is more support, non-stigmatizing. We're not talking about labeling kids. We're talking about identifying their strengths, the doctors, using those, but then talking about areas of weakness, but not stigmatizing. Some people get concerned about that, particularly when you, you invoke a little monitoring of mental health. You want to you want link assessments to results in a common language, too, so that people don't have to do what I call mental gymnastics in order to figure out, oh, we got this assessment result. Well, what do we do now in intervention? This intervention program doesn't refer to it. It talks about resilience. It talks about empathy talks about cooperation. I don't see those in my assessment. Well, they're probably there in embedded items, but the terminology matters. That's part of the value of this alignment. And then you want to have training to implement the intervention. And the intervention I'm going to show you fits the, the, the instructional style of a huge number of teachers. And it is all online, and it is uh, material so that it's easy to learn the material in a collaborative way. So I admit there's a lot to think about here. I apologize for the list. But if you want to 
invest in a sustainable program, what I mean, one that works, one that sticks, um, it, you got to think about these things. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, here's those dates again. Okay, I'm going to be fairly quick on this slide. In fact, Chris, if you want to just lay out all the strength-focused elements uh, for these gates, feel free to do that. So what, what you're going to see as, as Chris and I synchronize our work here today, the strength-focused side, I've, I've, it's brief, and you're going to learn about each of these. But for gate one, I'm making a recommendation about using a particular, what we call a brief SEL scale, okay? teacher and student, that's what TNS is. And then, then we're going to talk about intervention. So we're going to focus largely on gate one and tier one today's presentation. But what I want you to see as, you, as this unfolds and as some students don't respond and need more support and go to tier two or don't respond enough and go to tier three, you're going to see that we encourage this repetition of some assessment, reassessing and asking questions. And as you go up to gate Three, a, a more comprehensive measure comes into play. The rating form, more items, more potential assessors, a teacher, a student, and a parent. Because there's a greater need for support. And so the, the, there's a bit of a puzzle about the student, so more data is useful in driving and refining what follows in forms of intervention. The only difference now on the, inter, on the mental health focus side and, and so Chris can display all that. You'll see, too, some similarities, except that we basically add in at baseline gathering some data on what we call eight of the best indicators of mental health issues, okay? So it's using the exact same SEL uh, measures, but adding in eight indicators. And then that allows you to be a little more sensitive to some kids that might have internalizing difficulties, or you'll read, as you see, that we want to pick up on sort of precursors to bullying and that you can identify those. So what we're saying is, is if you're going to spend the time to screen for a universal FDL program, let's think, let's think big, let's think broad, and let's capture and, and know what kids might be at risk of some problems. So as we go forward, screen 28, Chris, you can, you can unpack everything there. Um, this is this is just more detailed, but uh, highlighting with a red box around tier one. This brings to light that I'm advocating that if you're going to do a strong universal program, you want to have a gate at the front end where you get this universal assessment of all kids. Um, you want to monitor um, from a teacher's perspective and from a student's perspective how well they're functioning, in effect, the baseline. Then you'll go into universal intervention where you'll teach, could teach 10 skills. You can teach more. The program now has grown to 30 skills. I don't recommend you try to teach 30 skills all at once or in one year. I, in fact, encourage you to, to teach a fundamental 10 and maybe a few others. It's important to tell you that the assessment results will guide you to the intervention skill units needed. These are ungraded. When you start looking at it, you're going to scratch your head and say, hey, where's the grade two stuff? Where's the grade four stuff? No. It's based upon the student's assessment results that tells you what to teach. Okay? Assessment is hand in glove with intervention. And then when you're done with the assessment, of course you want to know, was it effective? And so you want to reassess using the exact measures or in some cases, the kids that didn't do well or struggled, you could go more comprehensive if you want to. These are all measures in the SEL family. So I, I know that uh, there's an opportunity for questions and comments. I'm just not sure that Chris and I, given that we're both working on this slideshow, that, that you can monitor all those. Chris, were there any questions or comments? Yes, yeah, Steve, here's, here's a quick question. Um, are there three different intervention programs for the three different tiers through the SIP? Good, great question. I appreciate that question. And in theory, there can be uh, three, four, five, because you're going to see, kind of hold this thinking, you're going to see that there are 30 skill units, all of which are, are, are measured and, and you're informed about, 
And so you can customize what a Tier 2 would look like. You can customize what a Tier 3 would look like based on the needs of children. If the Tier 2 kids have self-management difficulties and relationship skill difficulties, then you can handpick the intervention units that teach those skills. Okay? So, um, but the, 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 the notion is that the skill units uh, are usable at every level. And I'm going to show you one of those units, and then I'll highlight a little bit more how you can customize some elements within the units to meet needs. Uh, some of you may have attended sessions I've done previously. I did a session on bullying, which was a very select group of items across 23 skills that bullies seem to have deficits in that we want to teach them those desired behaviors. Last year, I did a, a, a session for Miami schools on resilience, and there's another group of skills that would focus on advancing resilience, all within these 30 skill units. So there's customizable as well as you could repeat. In some cases, children who don't do well at universal level, all they need is more time, and so it would be a repetition of those same skills with more opportunities to practice and more feedback. Repetition sometimes seems like a nasty, dirty word. It's not for learners who are struggling. It's useful. Let's move forward, Chris, given the time of day. So we'll go to slide 30. And this opens uh, some of the details about the assessment options. I've been talking in general terms about them. I want to dive a little deeper into them, okay? So multiple informants, all of our measures, with one exception, all of our rating scales that have the capabilities of having three raters, teacher, parents, and students. These are all based on a nationally normed sample of 4,700 children, ages 3 through 18, and 115 schools, as noted at the bottom of the page. Um, the comprehensive rating forms, that's like 51 items, take about 15 to 18 minutes per student. And I'm thinking most people wouldn't use those as the first order of business to screen. They're too labor intensive. They're more likely to be used when, when you've got a child that has not done well in the universal and, you, and, and you're thinking, does he or she need a, a tier two? So it's really useful at a kind of a, a tier two look. The important point to understand is the brief scales are subsets of items from the comprehensive scales. So the results from a brief scale, the results from a comprehensive scale talk to each other. They're informative. So these are um, uh, tailored um, to fit various d demands and needs. So the brief scales can all be done in about five to seven minutes per student. So, so you can think of doing a whole group of students a whole class of students could fill out a brief scale in about 10 minutes, okay, given, you know, management of setting it up, asking them to do it, collecting information. Screening and progress monitoring, we have a tool that's at, you'll see that tool. It's, it's a unique rubric-based, performance-based rubric, I should say, that only teachers complete, and it takes the teacher the first time to complete it, to be honest with you, it probably take you about 35 minutes. The second time is going to take you probably 20 minutes to do. That's why we give this range for 25 students. This, this is the one that we, I talked about the research early on with false negatives, false positives, et cetera. Very useful tool that we find that teachers like. So there's two types of interpretive framework, too. Uh, norm reference, that's what many people want to use for screening because not only do they want to know how well kids did compared to kids uh, in their own classes, they want to compare them to a national sample. So, okay, the next page, page 32, this outlines in kind of in color-coded ways the uh, FDL edition, full form, um, teacher, parent, students. Uh, it yields five scores and a composite score for SEL. Those five scores are self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, um, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. There are two. One of the unique things that differentiate many Pearson tools, but almost no other instruments use these. We have validity indexes built into these to detect when, when there's faking or there's uh, concerns about the responses. If you're going to do student self-assessment, you need these kinds of tools so that you can identify who might be faking a response, a social desire, 
desirable response or an extreme response. Usually the response to that is simply, let's administer this again before we take this data and make an important decision from it. And by the way, these are both in English and Spanish versions for parents and students. They require, as I indicated before, about 15 to 18 minutes. Okay? And they're norm referenced. When you do this full form, what do you get? This is uh, a lot of school psych folks out there, uh, school social workers who are starting to work with the individual kids outside these universal programs. This is the kind of tool you need. And you can see on page 33, quickly, you can see that there's a profile that results from this. Uh, relative strengths and weaknesses characterizes performances in various ranges, average, above average, below average. And in this color-coded form, using a typical stoplight colorization, it gives you items in self-awareness, self-management, and relationship skills. Red lights are flashing. These are skills that they're having difficulty with. The yellow ones are skills that are still potentially concerns that they can develop more. So there's this translation of scale scores and subscale scores information into discrete uh, areas of action, specific items. And those items then lead to a skill unit. If we go to 34, um, I want to just, as I say, don't forget, this is the old standby tool. And old, I say affectionately. This is where all of the items from the SEL edition came from. They came from the work that Frank Gresham and I did back in the mid-2000s where we created this comprehensive scale. And as Chris clicks and highlights the problem behaviors on this, we, we basically have minimized checking in, uh, on problem behaviors, unless you want to utilize some of the, the brief screeners that I'm going to show momentarily that have mental health indicators in. By and large, our scales, most of the SEL scales, are all about desired behaviors, strength-focused positive behaviors. So as we move forward, Chris, into slide 35, you're going to see a new version. There you can even read some of these items. These are the 20 most efficient items, okay? Let me elaborate on that a little bit. If you click on that, Chris, you're going to see that to do these 20 items, this is a student scale. This is for third graders and above. There's 20 items. They're totally 100% aligned with the CASEL framework. You get five scores, self-awareness, self-management, uh, etc. You can use national norms with this, and the data behind it suggests that these scores are, uh, the inferences you make from scores are strong, uh, reliability and validity evidence. There's a corresponding, by the way, these are coming out in 2020. All the research is being done, tidied up now, and it's going to be available in 2020. Um, the, there's a corresponding scale that uses um, again, I want to highlight the same 20 SEL skills plus eight more. Red box shows that there's eight more. Uh, these are problem behaviors. These came from the original SSIS with lots of research to indicate when kids exhibit these eight behaviors, so you'll, you read closely, you're going to see four of them are externalizing behaviors, aggression towards other kids, bullying behaviors, and four of them are internalizing behaviors, uh, sadness, uh, uh, anxiety-based behaviors. Some people like to add this into the screening. It takes just a couple minutes more, and you're collecting data about a subset of children who may be at risk that you can do something about before a problem occurs. Then we'll click forward to 37. 37 is the teacher version of this. You might take stock here. You go, whoa, here's the teacher version. Same 20 behaviors that are in the students. By the way, some of you know this. We've used uh, IRT methods to come up with the items that give you the most information. And we, we short, in effect, we create a short form um, and using an IRT method that we lose very little information from the long form. And uh, we capture all this information in a short period of time. But with the teachers, we always want teachers to give us a glimpse of how academic functioning is happening, too. So we, we have a shorter version of our academic competency indice. And uh, as you click here, you can see this whole thing takes about seven minutes. There's 20 SEL items. There's three academic competency items, 23 items, six scores. The sixth score is academic competence. 
why do we care about this? Well, one of the reasons to promote SEL, besides it's a good part of mental health, is also that many of these behaviors function, remember, as academic enablers that improves academic function. So we want to capture that. And then there's the teacher version of the mental health scales as well. So we, we, we keep those three um, academic competency items. We keep the 20 uh, um, SEL items. And with the red box illustrates that we add in eight more of the problem behaviors or indicators of mental health problems. So, so, so I've exposed you to sort of classic rating scales that you can use for teachers and students to get your arms around your entire school population. Do you need to use both the teacher and the student? I encourage you to. I know some systems want just the student voice initially, and, and it's really useful. It does warm kids up to thinking analytically about themselves and fundamentally. I mean, it's a real fundamental self-awareness skill. Just to do a self-assessment is a self-awareness skill, so you're already, the assessment becomes part of an intervention. But I really encourage you to get the teacher engaged too, either through these what I call classic behavior rating scales, or as you see on slide 39, this is that this is this performance rubric. This has been out now for a couple of years. Lots of teachers use it. It's it is uh, yielding very useful information. I know it's hard to read, but what I want to highlight is that. Um, that we, we use this five-level system, kind of looks like a stoplight uh, color-wise, and um, the bulleted points in each of these levels deal with relationship skills. Those bulleted points are basically items from the rating scales, and they're the best items from the rating scales in terms of predictive validity. So again, we keep, we keep working this family of assessments so we, we're not trying to confuse you. We're trying to have this alignment between the content, the interpretive framework from CASEL, and, and the intervention framework. So you've got choices. Now, most teachers sit down, and they have their class roster. And if we look at uh, page 40, you get a better sense of this. I, on page 40, Chris has displayed all of the scales. And you go, hey, there's eight of them here, self-awareness, self-management defined exactly as CASEL defines them, and teachers think about all their students in a classroom at one time on self-awareness. This is a criterion reference, not a norm reference tool. All kids could be a level three in a classroom. All kids could be a level two. You never find that. I have never found that in all my work. Actually, this is a very nice way to sort, and teachers think about kind of either three buckets color-wise, or five buckets gradations of, of, of the proficiency level. You don't have to do the motivation to learn, reading skills, and math skills rubric if you don't want to, but it's highly recommended. You do get a total score from this. You can add up to five SEL areas and get a total. And then it leads you to, as illustrated in slide 41, it leads you to um, particularly when you use Review 360 as a, the way to enter the data. And, and this is basically illustrating what a, what a teacher would see on Review 360. And for the self-awareness, they see all their students. They think about all their students at one time on self-awareness. Then they think about all their students on self-management, et cetera. And it yields really powerful reports. Again, you kind of get, you got to look at the result here, the overall. But this is, I'm going to show you a few screenshots from Review 360. And you can see um, in this uh, example a uh, report for a school by grade level, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. They're color-coded in the pie chart. And then it takes each grade and starts using sort of the stoplight bar chart framework and tells you the percentage of children when you think about overall self, social emotional competence. And then you can break it down in each of these five areas. And if you think about this, you do this on the front end of before you do intervention. And if your intervention is effective, you should see the colors starting to change proportionally, more green, more yellow, less red, et cetera, as we go forward. So uh, slide 42 is more of the same. It's taking a grade level snapshot at this again and um, basically highlights um, uh, 
the results that you have. And then, and then one of the big deals about the report is you've got an action plan. That's slide 43. And you know, I want you to look at this just a minute. It's got the five areas that we keep highlighting in the capital framework that's part of our interpretive framework. It's got the assessment results, average ratings, number of students rated, and then it has, it tags the area. Let's focus on relationship skills because that's red. And it says, this is a high area of need, okay? And there are six skill units across the 30 skill units available that you could teach, unit two, unit six, seven, et cetera. So it's aligned with and helps you make decisions about instruction. So let me pause there for just a second. Chris, I know that time has elapsed a little bit, so I'd like to just kind of run to the end and, and see if we have any questions then. And as you know, I'm always happy to answer questions by email with people. So can we do that? Yes, Steve, I move forward to the next section. Okay, so good, we're on universal intervention. And um, let's, let's dig in. Um, so slide 46, uh, skills assessed are the skills taught. This is the list of 30 skills that are available in it. Hard to read, but uh, I'm gonna illustrate some. But listen, as, as Chris clicks on the red box, you'll see that there are 10 highlighted in what we call the core skills. They are listens to others, says please and thank you, follow the rules, pays attention to your work. Skill five is ask for help. Skill six, takes turn when you talk. Skill seven, gets along with others. That's a, that's a relationship skill. Each of these is being tagged in one of those uh, content areas. Do, stay calm with others. That's a self-management skill. Do the right thing. That's a responsible decision-making skill. And do nice things for others. Great. That's a social awareness skill. So uh, what I'm arguing is, and what the DePerna research that I highlighted uh, early on is having an evidence-based practice, is that these are the core ten. Teach these first. Emphasize these. These are foundational. And then as you, as you work forward, so this would be a great universal program, and as you work forward with older kids and over time, where you know these ch children have these skills in their repertoire, you can focus on more of the advanced skills. And I'm gonna highlight in a few minutes some of the new advanced skills. Up until this year, there were only 23 skills in this area, but now there are 30. And I, I want to play off of that. Let's go to the next slide, Chris. Slide 40, uh, 60, I guess 68, is that what it is? 47. It says 68 because I took a clip and moved it forward, Chris. It's really slide 47. Now, take a pause and look at this. And what I've done is taken that performance rubric, kind of made it look like stair steps, where kids are stepping up, if you will, as they get more skill. That's what that shows. As you click on it, you see increased quality and freedom of skills used. And then what you'll see is across the top, you see three social situations. These are actually part of the intervention program that I'm using for illustration. These are role plays. And, and we've intentionally designed role plays to go from fairly easy, not complex, to more complex social skills and situations. And, and it's important to understand this, that as kids are working through a skill unit, you might say, we're working on one skill. Actually, you're working on six, in our program, six applications of that one skill. Okay? Hold that thought, because this is a deceptively simple-looking program, only teaching 10 skills. But if you do all the 10 core skills, you really have taught 60 applications of that skill the kids need to learn to effectively function in a school environment. Going ahead to the next slide, slide 48. These are new ones. Um, I'm not gonna take much time on it, but what I wanna highlight is we are continuing to update the intervention program. And uh, when, you, when you purchase the advanced skills over time, you'll be, you'll be seeing that you've purchased 20, 25, 30. We're gonna bring in new skills because we, we have the data in the assessments to drive people to these skills. And we have an instructional system that, that allows for this. This does not complicate the system. This actually allows the system to become more customizable.
recognizable, particularly for people who are working in Tier 2 and Tier 3 with children and need a stronger dose of skills and so self -aware, social awareness or relationship. So moving forward, here's the core instructional uh, process that we use. We've learned this from teachers years over, but you can also go look at the meta-analytic work in the social skills and social-emotional learning arena, and it will also tell you that high-powered industrial strength, if you will, <laughs> um, interventions use the following six phases, tell, show, do, practice, monitor progress, and generalize. And as you think about this as an interventionist, whether that's a teacher in a universal program or school psychologist, social worker in a tier two program, counselor in a tier two program, you're gonna, the tell show is where the, you're in control. And in fact, the next slide probably tells you better. You can see the translation of tell show is basically being, the, 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 the group leader is in control here. It's talking to students, it's modeling. And then you move into the do and practice phases. These are gradations of role plays where students try out the things, the skill steps that they heard the teacher talk about and model. And then you move into the monitor, monitor progress phase, and that is getting people to reflect, how well did I do when I was practicing these? And what do I need to emphasize? And then finally, the generalization phase, and this is where programs can take on an expanded life. We, we clearly want teachers and, and others to think about how else can I use this skill, staying calm with others, for example, um, uh, in other places in the school and at home. Every one of these units I'm gonna show you has three lessons in it. So I talk about 30 skill units, but each skill unit has three lessons for 30 minutes. So we're talking about 90 minutes of lesson. That's, this takes us way back to that time point that I made earlier. 900 minutes if you do the core instruction. 900 minutes. That's 1.5% of a school year of student time. Minuscule. Let's go further, Chris. Let's start looking at what's going on. All of these resources, as illustrated in slide 51, and there's a bunch of them. Chris is clicking on and showing you that the, the heart of the instructional program is a PowerPoint program. Yes, a PowerPoint program. All of these skills are on PowerPoint, okay? And as you look at this PowerPoint, the, the, the largely white space area is what we want students to look at. They definitely can look at the color band on the left-hand side, but that's the space that a teacher or an interventionist will read from. That's their abbreviated script. There is a manual that comes with this. That's detailed script. So this is a in, in evidence-based treatment terms, this is a this is a, uh, a, a manualized treatment. Uh, it's in, in a layperson's term, it's a cookbook. It's got these steps that you do and follow. Now, my experience with really effective teachers is that they follow the recipe the first couple times they do it, and then they start making some adjustments, not changing the skill or the skill step, but changing some of the <clears throat> some of the activities, some of the role plays. That's where you get to make this really authentic and responsive to your students' needs. There are other elements, and I'm gonna illustrate these elements, but you can see videos, you can see cue cards, you can see emotion cards, um, et cetera. So let's move forward and, and start looking at an example skill that we do. So I'm on slide 52. The example skill is gonna be getting along with others. This is a classic relationship skill from a from a, a capital framework perspective, okay? So the SDL components, I said there's a manual. You can get this hard copy or you can buy it digitally. And then you get access to all of these materials are then online. There is a micro website. That micro website currently is managed by Pearson. It's soon gonna be managed by the SS Colab group and I'm going to uh, expand the number of units but they're all gonna be basically the same. You're, you can see right now in the upper right-hand corner, the skill is labeled unit seven, get along with others, digital lessons, skill step, cue card, role play cards, videos. One video is a positive model, one video is a negative model, okay? And so, um, so all your materials are there that you need to communicate with parents and teach other people and tools that engage students. So 
Um, here's an excerpt from the manual. It illustrates the tell, show, do framework, and uh, the colored screens are uh, summations of the videos. The videos are very brief, okay, but they're layered in, as you might guess, in the show phase. We use the videos to show kids, uh, other children. Uh, there are racially mixed. Uh, uh, actors, mind you, no vulgar language or physical aggressiveness, but but stimulus. These videos serve as stimulus to get kids thinking, and you often will show the video several times because you ask children to take a different perspective. Take the perspective of the boy in this one. Take the perspective of the girl in this one in the pink blouse, etc. Because those perspectives are important in building understanding. Uh, about the importance of these skills and how they get applied. So as we move forward to slide 55, this is a, sort of the classic opening slide. Um, there's various pictures, various developmental ages. These are fairly young children, admittedly, in this slide. But we always start out with, with a picture or pictures to try to engage all students in the classroom. And we ask, what is happening? And there's a discussion about that. And then we define the behavior. Getting along with others means, and then we read that definition. And then you would move forward to the next slide, and very shortly, often the second slide is introducing some skill steps. And you can see that as you work through these skill steps, and they're animated, so students would see step one, think about others. And then you click uh, step two, step three, by the way. And then there's a chart that you can download all these are downloadable. You can copy and put on the wall. So there's a constant reminder what the skill steps are, and you can see the skill step chart. And we also encourage you to download what we call a student engagement record. This is a, not all kids can write and do all the work on this, but you want them to try. And as you can see, there's, there's several sections on there. There's one simply writing the skill steps. There's a section dealing with emotions using emoji faces. There's a section dealing with progress monitoring, using a ladder as a sort of a metaphor of making progress up the ladder and keeping track of that. As we move forward to uh, slide 57, you can, this is where there's always under the show phase, the videos that highlight uh, a, a desirable interaction, uh, listening to others, and a not so desirable interaction. Then as we move to uh, slide 58, this is the, the sort of the typical do phase. This is where we're moving stuff into the hands of some students. When we do the do phase, we usually don't have all the students doing a role play. We get a subset of students to do it. And of course, with three lessons and any given skill unit across the course of the week, almost every student in the classroom can be sort of featured in one of these uh, guided role plays. Then we move to uh, slide 59, which is the, the practice phase. This is where you bring in the role play cue cards. Two of them are on the right-hand side of this, of this slide. And uh, this is where, actually, I encourage users of this to read these role play cards and to expand it or actually take some of these out and use your own role play situation. Make these authentic to your school, to your classroom, okay? Ask older kids to help you get engaged in thinking about what are some of the challenging social situations where you have to learn how to get along with other students. You can bring them into this without changing the skill steps, without changing the instructional process, but by enriching the role plays. The next slide, slide 60, highlights this, this ongoing monitor your progress. We ask individual students to monitor their progress and to write it down on their little um, student record. And we ask the teacher to think, let's think about how the whole class is doing. What do we need to work on in terms of these four skills for the skill of getting along with others, four skill steps? And, and so there's notation and engagement. Uh, this is getting us into this acronym. Remember I said SAFER? Well, SAFER stands for, as you see this, uh, safer, safer stands for sequence. We got a sequence. You got to admit we got a sequence. Tell, show, do, etc. It's uh, it's uh, active. We want people interacting, getting up and doing it. Role play, practice, big active. It's it's focused on specific skills. It's explicit about what you have to do and when you need to do it. And by the way, 
It's R. It's responsive. If you take the option to think about generalization with your students, as illustrated here in 61, and to customize role plays, you are creating a, a, a responsive tool that will fit your school situation. So I'm going to click quickly, uh, Chris, slide 62. This is, this is, no, this is lesson two. Lesson two in these three lesson cycles becomes much more involving emotions. We got the fundamental behaviors down. Now we want kids to start thinking about their emotions. So I use this slide just to highlight that. Um, and then there's six fundamental emotions that we use in this system. You can think of hundreds, I know, but as the research says, there's really four fundamental emotions that we all have, and they're all variations off of, off of, of those happy, sad, uh, afraid, and mad. And uh, so we've taken those and built them out a little bit. You can go further if you wish. Um, another example of highlighting emotions and getting kids to think about how they feel in different situations and how they think other people feel. Learning that is challenging. Okay. And then we, we move on to slide 64. Um, lots of things can, we always end on generalization. Don't give this short shrift, okay? Too many people say, oh, I'm running out of time. I can't do, I can't do the generalization thing. Generalization can happen in your curriculum. Yes, you can do this program in an isolated 25-minute block, but then you can start thinking about how can I get kids to use this skill someplace throughout the week in my classroom, in my curriculum. That's all about, that's how you expand this. That's where the power's at. Teach this skill ideally early in the day and find opportunities to use it throughout the day with kids, okay? So, um, we're, we're bearing down at the end of the session. I want to respect your time. I've got just a few takeaway points, Chris, starting on slide 67. It's a highlight, of course. There's, there's five competencies. They come from CASEL. There's 58 one items that all of our assessments have been built off of these 51 items. Some assessments have only 20 items, but they're the, they're the, the, the highly predictive items when we, when we start shorting them up. And they all lead to currently 30 skills. So it's a pretty simple program. We tried to simplify it because we want it done really well, okay? Do whatever you do really well. And, and make it responsive. So I'm highlighting this is a, an example uh, of the role play cards where I was saying, review this before you teach a lesson. Think about your class. Think about your school. And maybe you want to modify some of these. Maybe you want to create some additional cue cards. You've got cover stock. You can do just like we did. These are printable, downloadable, et cetera. You can make it work. And then understand. Understand this notion that there is a progression of skills. We're only teaching, if you do the SIP, 10 skills, but we're teaching them and asking kids to apply them in different social situations. Those role plays are the first wave of social situations. And then, of course, when you get kids operating this way in your classroom, you're creating many, many more. That's where the power of this becomes. Kids get an opportunity to play these skills out, okay? Finally, um, I want to leave you with the math. Here's the math, 180 plus. What do I mean? That's what ultimately I think. There's 30 skills. There's six role plays. They result in 180 skill applications. And you don't have to be working in the dark. You know, based on these assessments that are fully aligned with this, the areas in which kids need to work in. You can be responsive to their needs, okay? You can prompt these skills uh, in your classroom because these are fundamental skills that many of them happen every day. Not all of them, responding to teasing. We hope that doesn't happen every day, but many of them do, okay? So there's the, that the acronym. The SIF is safer, folks. It's sequence, active, focused, explicit, and responsive. Um, and I think you will find that it simplifies um, universal intervention. It simplifies Tier 2 and Tier 3 intervention. And it fits nicely into a multi-tiered support system. So I want to thank you for coming. There's references here if you want to follow up on some of the sources of the, the research that supports this. And I want to remind you that there are other lessons that I've done over the years. There's 13 of them. Chris, Sherry, and I have all worked together on 13 of these previous ones. And they're at the Pearson website, 
is highlighted here. So best of uh, success to you. Thumbs up for the school year. And stay in touch with me. My email's there. I welcome emails, and I'll be glad to respond to you. Have a great school year. Thank you. Thank you.